Hello and welcome to the video. This is a video for all of you that have been getting in touch with me asking how do I update iNav on these Atom RC versions of their models that have a flight controller already installed. This is the Dolphin, probably my favourite wing slash plane at the moment, and it comes with a flight controller, one of the Atom RC F405 wing boards, their own particular version of it. Now there's a Dolphin version, there's also a Swordfish version as well, and both of them come with all the connections done, so it's just the software that you might have to update. Now it comes with iNav 5.1 installed, or the ones that I've had here have. But as I've recorded this one, iNav 6.1.1, and I've had loads of people getting in touch saying, how do you do the update? Now I'm gonna go through this in this particular video. I'm gonna show you all the steps that I do. It's not particularly tricky, but if you really want to understand iNav, I strongly recommend go watch one of the iNav for Beginners series. They're designed specifically for those of you that have never done this before and takes you through each individual step. Even if you're not going to have to do all of the wiring up, going through and seeing each of the individual steps will help you understand how you set up the entire system. Because we can cheat a little bit because in theory, the manufacturer has already set up things like the servos and set up the port for the GPS and stuff and calibrated the accelerometer, we can kind of copy all that information into the latest version of iNav and save us some messing about. However, that does mean that we'd still have to do a little bit of setting up in here. Whenever I go from a major version to a major version, I usually will blow away all of the PIF settings and the uh, tune and start again and go through a tune at the field. It's a very quick and easy process with iNav and it works incredibly well. See my videos, I'm gonna to link to all this stuff below if you wanna go and see it. But for those of you that just wanna see how I would update something like this and take it to the latest version, I will show you. Last big word of advice is I've also done a video talking about how to do a full update of iNav, something like iNav 5.0 to iNav 6.0. Again, that link is below. Why am I talking about that? Well, for some of you, you may have got this, you may have played with it, you may have already gone through the setup, got the on-screen display configured how you want, the radio's working fine, it's flying beautifully. You just want to update to iNav 6 to get your things like the horizon drift sorted out. And also maybe you're a HD pilot like me and you want the full benefit of all the HD goodness. So let me jump on the bench and show you all the steps. So if this is a new ready to fly model that comes with iNav pre-installed, I would recommend that we connect to it and have a look at how everything's configured, specifically around things like the accelerometer calibration, but also things like the GPS settings too. I'm gonna to plug it in. And at the moment it's gone into DFU mode and that's probably because the button is pressed in on the little board. So let's make sure that that isn't the case. And then what we'll do is we will click on connect. Now, this is a very common thing. I've actually made a separate video about this. The reason that we have this issue where it's basically just coming into the CLI is because the version, and if we type version and hit enter here, we can see that it's been supplied with version 5.1, where this is the latest configurator that we're gonna to use to set it up and upgrade it. This is 6.1. 6.1 won't talk to 5.1. So we need the same version of the configurator for the model that we want to talk to. So let's disconnect from here. Let's close out this. Now what we could do is we could go and just download, just scroll here in the iNav configurator releases and we can go down here until we find version five and download it. I've already done that and put it on the computer and I keep all of them and I'd recommend that you do here. So let's find iNav Configurator 5.1 and run that. And then once that's set up, that should allow us to connect to it and have a look at all the different settings. So we'll close, it's gonna want us new version because it's an old version we're using. We're gonna connect and here we are. We can see everything as I lift the nose of the model up, there it is in the screen. And it's appearing here as a flying wing because although it has a V-tail or vertical stabilizers, it doesn't have a rudder. And we can see here that the GPS isn't powered. We can get a lot of information from this screen. It's worthwhile before we go much further, just having a quick look through the tabs so we can see that it's calibrated. We'll have to copy the accelerometer calibration across. That will save us having to calibrate when we come to the next piece. 
We can check the mixer, how they've got that configured, although we'll do that ourselves in a moment, but you can see it's all very standard stuff for a wing. We can see for the output section, they've got it all turned on, but they've gone for DSHOT 600 for the ESC protocol. So this ESC is obviously capable of that. We will set that up too. And there is a slight offset, interestingly, for the two servos. But as I move the plane around, I think that's more to do with the fact that it's defaulting into a stabilized mode because the middle positions are set for 1500 and the rates are 100. This looks pretty standard stuff. The only other thing I'd look at probably in here is the ports. Lots of ports on this flight controller. The one that the GPS is connected to is UART4. So we're gonna have to make sure that that's how we do it. And UART2 is being selected as the serial receiver. Just very quickly look in the receiver tab. So by default, this comes configured for CRSF. So that's what UART2 would be connected to. So this looks all pretty standard stuff. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna copy all of this and save it so that we have a copy of all the configuration that we can copy in. So I'm doing a diff all. I'm gonna save it to a file. I'm gonna pop it on the desktop. We'll call it something that I'll remember. There we are. And now if we disconnect from the model and we close out this version of the configurator, if I open that default file that we've just had, this is what it looks like. And we can see here that here's the stuff that we'll probably copy it across. That we'll have the servo mix, and in fact, what we can do is we can get rid of all the stuff that we're probably not going to use. The motor mix looks fine. The features look good. The black box, not bothered about those particularly. Um, these are the ports. We'll copy those across. OSD layout, I don't care. I'll do those again. This is how it's set up. Um, again, probably change it. And there's some configuration stuff here. So now we have this, we're ready for the next stage to go and actually do the update. So to do this, we are gonna to have to run the latest version of INF Configurator. So what we'll do is we'll start INF Configurator 6.1, which is the latest one, and we will click on it there. Once it's running, then what we'll do is we will plug the flight controller back in, wait for it to boot and appear. There it is. Rather than go and connect to it, we're going to go into firmware flasher and then what we'll click is auto select target. And if it has already figured out what the flight controller is, we can choose the latest firmware. 611 is what I minimum would recommend. 6.1 had an issue with porpoising. We'll keep everything the same. We'll do a full chip arrays though. And then what we'll do is we'll click on load firmware online and then flash firmware and we should see it reboot into DFU mode. It'll erase the flight controller and start to copy everything across. Now, if it doesn't go into DFU mode, then I'll put a link down below to my video about Zadig. That's the way that I would set it up. Uh, you can fix the driver issues on your computer. There's also the Impulse RC driver fixer. I'll put a link down to that as well. Uh, but it should, once you've set it up, for your computer once, it should automatically figure it out. So now we are flashing the flight controller. And when it comes back, what we'll do is we'll copy a couple of the sections from the default that we've just copied from the old version. Specifically, I'm interested in the accelerometer calibration. That's going to save us having to go through that process again, which can be trickier if it's a larger model with big wings. And then we'll also copy the ports configuration over so the GPS is configured properly. And then we'll run through the rest as we would a standard iNav setup. So it says the programming is successful. We'll give it a second to reboot and then we'll click on connect. It'll ask us first of all, what is it in? We're gonna say an airplane without a tail. Don't forget, because this one hasn't. It's gonna set the default settings and then it's going to reboot. And then we can start working our way through all of the stuff on the left-hand side. 
So now comes the majority of the work. What we have to do is work our way through the tabs here as we would do normally with any setup. However, because we've saved some of the settings, we can definitely make sure that we don't have to do the calibration. We can set up things like the mixer and the outputs and some other stuff too. Because if we started this, we could absolutely go through each of these steps. We can see the accelerometer calibration isn't done. We could do that, then go into the mixer and select all the pieces that we need. However, because initially we told it that it was gonna be a wing uh, configuration without a tail. It's kind of set that up for us already. We can then go and set up the ports. Uh, by default on these Atom flight controllers, these Atom RC F405 flight controllers, UART2 is your serial receiver. Uh, you can either plug in your CRSF stuff into UART2, which is here on the flight controller, or you can plug your SBUS into the SBUS pins here in the bottom right hand corner. The, both of those work as uh, the same serial port essentially, but you can change it round. Now we could go and set all those up, but we have done the default. So we're going to cheat and we're going to copy some of the stuff and the configuration stuff in here. So if I look in the default file, we will first of all, we'll copy the servo mix. So control C and put in here control V and we'll do enter. That's going to set my servos up the way it was in the previous version. Then we're going to copy the servo stuff. So we'll pop that in two. We'll then copy the serial stuff across. And because again, the default is not all configuration files. It's just the stuff that's changed. So that should hopefully do that as well. And then the accelerator, accelerometer, then the accelerometer calibration is something we're really after. That is those things there. So we're just going to cut and paste those into there. Hit enter. So that will basically copy the accelerometer calibration across. If you are happy, that's going to be all right. And the last thing to do is then we'll just search for get AHRS calibration because if it's a wing, then it should be adaptive, which it is. So what we'll do is we'll just save that. And then that is going to set up quite a few of the tabs to be the same as it was before. Again, as I mentioned in the introduction, if you have a model that's already set up from the factory that, you're, that you've already gone through and you've done all your configuration and your tuning and your parameters and your servos and everything else, then you know what? I would just use the uh, Mr. D following with style tool to copy all the settings across. But we're assuming for this video that we're gonna go through each of these pieces in turn. Now, all of the things now are green on the right hand side and that's because the calibration is done and if we go back into setup and we lift the nose of the model there it is and it's sat on the desk slightly off to the left hand side we can kind of see that's the case on the screen oh looks really good we're going to go into the mixer and just confirm that that looks fine uh, mixer looks good we will confirm in a moment that the control services are all working in the right way outputs at the moment are disabled make sure that your prop isn't on until you've got everything set up ESC protocol if you remember was set to DSHOT 600 so you know what we will kind of um, save and reboot that and that will then hopefully mean that we can control both the ESC and also the servos but we'll just confirm everything's okay in a moment then check the ports tab the ports tab should have the GPS configured there it is. Um, at the moment, it's not pairing in the top, and that is because we haven't told INAV to use a GPS, but the serial port configuration is now there. That's one of the things we covered across. The configuration tab, we're gonna go and set a couple of things up. At the moment, the barometer set. I'll probably keep that on for the moment. And then down here, we will do turn GPS on the navigation and telemetry. And so when we reboot it next time, we'll get a red GPS, but that's perfectly normal. The GPS isn't powered. Uh, from what I can see by the USB cable. Unfortunately, the receiver isn't either on these flight controllers, which is disappointing. Uh, everything else looks okay. We'll permanently enable launch mode for fixed wing, which is how I personally like to set it up. As soon as it's armed, it's ready to throw into the air. And I'll also set continuous, 
continuously trim servos on fixed wing. That means that as I'm flying around and in one of the self-level modes, it'll trim the servos. So when I go into manual to fly normally, it'll take care of that. The rest of it I'm happy with. So we'll save and reboot. Next time it comes up, we should see here in the top that it'll try and talk to the GPS. But because the GPS isn't talking back because it hasn't got any power, it'll go red up here. And don't worry about that, that's perfectly fine. Failsafe, we will set it to return to home because that's kind of the whole point of having iNav, isn't it? That you can get the thing back, particularly with a preset model like this from Atom RC. And again, I have moved the GPS into what I consider a slightly more sensible location away from the other electronics. Pit tuning, I would do an auto tune and an auto level in my maiden flight. So I don't tend to get too worried about that. Receiver, now in the receiver tab, uh, depending on what you have selected, depends on what you're going to set up here. Now, I have set my radio to aileron, elevator, throttle and rudder to match this channel map. I've added a couple of extra channels as well. Very standard stuff. I have a video that I'll link down to below that goes through how you configure your radio to set this kind of model up. I'm not going to cover it here. But I would add channel 5 as your arming switch. I would add channel 6 as your mode. And I usually set up channel 8 as something like my uh, beeper. And at the moment, I've got everything connected via CRSF into UR2. So I need to tell it in here that I'm not using SBUS, I'm using CRSF. And then when we power everything, because at the moment, unfortunately, the receiver is also not powered by the USB cable, uh, we need to make sure that all these middle channel values are 1500. And when the sticks go to the top right hand side of the radio, all these values go high. But we'll do that when we get to that point for the final checks. Modes tab is the next one that we need to set up. So now we know that my channel five is arming and we'll set it up like that. I personally would set up, uh, normally I don't use angle, I tend to use horizon is the one that I tend to have in the low position. And that is also kind of the default that it will go back to. I like having manual set up as well for my regular normal flying. That's how I tend to fly most of my INAV planes. And then in the third position, that's gonna give me acro. Having things like auto trim and auto tune set up on a couple of other switches on the radio can be incredibly useful for those initial flights and tuning. And the only thing that I set up then apart from that is good old beeper. I'd recommend you set this up, particularly on a flight controller like this that have a beeper. It helps you find it when it disappears in long grass and you can get close using the RSI tricks, but then you just need a noise just to kind of let you home in on the final pieces. Click save and then that is your mode set up. Every particular pilot has their own way of doing it. I try and keep it super simple. Just then means that I have it the same on all of my models. Going into the OSD tab, then that's one of the other places that I recommend that you go in to tweak how everything works. On-screen display is again something that's very specific for how you want to fly, but the great thing about iNav 6.0, 6.11 is that it now has the ability for you to select uh, HD systems as well as the onboard analog system that comes as part of this flight controller. The last thing I check is here in the advanced tuning tab for the fixed wing stuff. Make sure things like the auto launch stuff assess how you like. I tend to like a very strong high prop speed and thrust for when I throw it and just go through and just double check this is how you want it. Uh, once you've done INAV a few times you'll find the settings in here that you like that you really get the benefit from. So I would just have a quick scan through here. Most of the default settings these days are actually really good. So with that stuff all set, we're ready to plug the battery in and check that things like the control surfaces and the radio are all good. So let's check if the radio and not only the radio, but also things like the control surfaces are moving in the right direction. Now I would recommend um, that you have something like a smoke stopper if you've never done this before. I'm reasonably happy with this model. So I am going to plug in the USB cable and we are gonna to have to power it because we need the servos powered and we also need to have the GPS powered and make sure that those bits work too. Now I'm gonna power it from a battery here and we'll plug it in in a moment, but I would always check if it's a new model, just either use a smoke stopper or get yourself something like a ohm meter and just check it's not um, completely unhappy over there. It shouldn't be a short. So let's turn the radio on. 
Now again, I've configured the radio here with the Lua script and things as well. So when it comes on, it, it's going to show me all the important information, but we'll set that to the side. We'll power the model up. And again, we have no prop installed. We don't want the prop installed, but now we have the telemetry information on the radio because it's CRSF. We turn telemetry on. So we now can see as I move the model, we can see the artificial horizon moving. It's going to be great. So let's plug it into the computer and do the final things. So let's click on connect. And now we can see the GPS has gone blue. We actually have the GPS uh, talking to the flight controller. So that is really good. Now we just need to go into the receiver tab. And what we're going to do, we can see the middle channel positions are all 1500. That is fantastic. If it hadn't been, then we'd use the trims on the radio to set that up. And what we're going to do is move the sticks on the radio to the top right hand corner and they all go to their maximum value. And when I let go of the sticks, it works. Throttle is in the right place. That is all working perfectly. Modes are on channel six at the moment, so I can move those around. Let me just do that very quickly because we'll need that for the next piece. So I would just change that to channel six and that to channel six. Remember how you set your radio up and everything is completely up to you. But there we go. But that now means that I can, I can flick the mode switch on the radio and we can see it's going from horizon to manual. Why is that important? Well, the next thing we need to do is to make sure all the control surfaces are going in the right direction. And we need to do that in manual mode. So what we're going to do is we're going to move the, hopefully you can see it's okay. We're going to move the aileron. If I put it over there, maybe you'll see it to the left and right. They're moving great. And if I pull the stick down for the elevator, they should both come up. And they do. That's fantastic. That is really good. Now that looks fab. Now the only thing is, is both of these are slightly low so we can fix that inside configurator. So here in configurator, we can go into the outputs, scroll down here. We can turn on live mode and you can see here that channel three and four are connected. So what we're going to do is we'll change the middle position and hit enter. And we see that's the wrong way. So that needs to be 1400. Oh, that's nearly, that's nearly right. I would say probably 1440 is probably perfect. On the other one, I would say that that is probably about 1550. We need it. Again, you can just eyeball this. When it's flying, it's it's all going to be auto sorted anyway. GPS, good, ready to fly. There we go. She's got a GPS lock. The radio has told us so. We're going to save that. Now, the last thing we need to do then is just confirm this is all happy. Is we'll put it back into horizon mode. Ready to fly. And then what we'll do is we'll rock the plane gently and we should see the wing that's rising, the control surface rise as well. And it does. So that is looking in fantastic condition. We know that everything is working in the right way. We know that the receiver's working fine. The GPS has locked up. We know that everything is fab. So at this point, I would call this done. Last job then is to install whichever uh, FPV system you're interested in. Make sure your central gravity is in the right place and you're kind of ready to fly. So the final thing I'll talk about, because I know I'm going to get asked, is where do you plug everything in on the flight controller? Well, let's start off with the radio control pieces. This is showing how I have my ELRS. This is the receiver here. This is a beta FPV uh, diversity receiver, and it has four wires coming out of it, a black, a power, and a transmit and receive pin. They go all the way and plug into UR2, which is ground five volts receive and transmit. The transmit pin here goes to the receive pin on UR2, and that's what that connector is doing. And then all you have to do is then in the receiver tab, say that you're using CRSF, which is how I've got mine set up. That also means that when you select telemetry, telemetry comes back down this wire 
into the receiver and goes back down to the radio, which is how I'm running the Lua script and getting those live updates. But if you want to use SBUS, then the only difference is there are the three pins down here, ground, 5 volts, and SBUS. These three pins are where you're going to plug in your SBUS cable from your SBUS receiver, and then just select SBUS as the receiver type in the receiver tab in iNav, and then that will all work too. One word of warning with these flight controllers is that they don't do smart port very well. If you're using an SBUS receiver from FreeSky that has a smart port connection and you want to use that for telemetry, then unfortunately the only way you're going to get that to work on either UART 1 or UART 3 is by using the smart port inverted hack. Now I haven't had to use that for many years and I'm really not sure what's going on with this flight controller where that is necessary. I hope that gets fixed, but be aware of that. I spent quite a long time trying to get smart port to work on this flight controller and eventually gave up and just switched to Express LRS. So it's an either or, UART 2 can either run these pins here if it's selected as SBUS or it'll run over here as a CRSF connected receiver, so a Crossfire or an Express LRS. In terms of where you plug in the servos, which are these things here, S1 is going to be your motor connection that is plugged in by default from the manufacturer. And then I've plugged in S3 and S4, which are these two into the corresponding connections in the wings. So those are the two that you just plug them in. Just be careful here that the black wire or the ground wire, which is normally at the edge of the board, which is the convention that pretty much everyone else uses, uh, Atom RC have decided to forgo that convention and the black cable is actually here. The ground is inboard and the signal is on the edge, which is usually the wrong way around. Just be careful with these two, get them in the right way round. Uh, as I'm kind of looking at it, the right hand wing is coming in and connected to S3, the left hand wing is connecting to S4. If you ever have it so you can't get all of the controls working in the right direction, uh, don't do anything on the radio. Just it's probably that you've got these the wrong way around. Just come in here and swap them over and then go through the setup process again, reversing things in iNav. It's a very common problem that I see. But those are the connections and that's how you plug everything in. The only other things are shown here on the wiring diagram for the Atom RC stuff. So you can see here how everything else is connected, including things like the DJI connection, but that could also be used for things like Wartsnail and HD02. So there you have it, it's all set up on iNav611. What I would do is go to the field, add probably another couple of switches to the radio for auto level and auto tune. Initially, launch it using auto launch. I trust auto launch implicitly when it's set up uh, properly. It just works and it can do a far better job of catching a plane that might not be proper uh, and just rescue it on that first attempt. Once it's flying and I have it in cruise throttle, then I will stick it while it's still in horizon mode, pop it into auto level, fly it around and then turn auto level off to make sure it's learned where the offset needs to be. Then I will probably go into auto tune. To be in auto tune, you have to be in acro, then enable auto tune, then fly around, do all the flicky stuff. And then finally put it back into manual and just check it's flying beautifully. And when it is, I'm happy. I might do a return to home check, see my Baden videos for all those processes, but that's the donkey work done really. You can, as I said at the beginning, if you already have a model like this, that's already set up and working beautifully in iNav5, the process to upgrade it is pretty much a piece of cake now. Um, Mr. D falling with style, do check out his YouTube channel. It's a fantastic, has written a tool that you can import your diff all from iNav5 and it'll do all the stuff you need to. So you can just import it to iNav6 and you're ready to go instantly. It's really clever stuff. But hopefully for those of you that maybe have one of these and it's you're trying to connect to it, it's an old version of iNav and you want it on the latest and greatest, that's the process. Thank you for watching the video. If you watch my videos and find them useful, then please take a moment to hit the like and subscribe button. It helps the channel a lot. If you really like what I'm doing here, you can become a Patreon and support the time I spend helping others and get access to lots of exclusive benefits. Link is in the video description. Remember that all the videos on the channel are organized into playlists, so you can easily use those playlists to find all the videos on a subject that you are interested in. Add Painless360 to your searches on Google and YouTube, and it'll help you find my content for any particular topic. Thanks again for watching, and as always, happy flying.